Um, thanks everyone for coming and joining us tonight. I hope that you can all hear me just fine. Um, we do have our Q&A box. There's a problem. I'm going to moderate that and try and troubleshoot as we go. Uh, my name is Denicia Monet Malone. I'm the programs and facilitator for the Purdue Black Cultural Center. We are very happy to have you here with us virtually and uh, I hope that this finds everyone, you know, um, healthy and and sane wherever they are uh, as we weather this global pandemic together. I really appreciate you taking some time out of your evening, um, what for some of you might be your private time to join us for this conversation. But we are we are ecstatic to be here for this dialogue. We think it's quite timely for what's going on, um, and I'm so grateful for the panelists and for the moderator for joining us. Uh, to facilitate this. Um, tonight's conversation is about the race divide in philanthropy. It's gonna touch on a few different topics, uh, crossing trends in the sector, um, the nuances of giving in within communities of color and um, the power of response uh, from the sector during, during times of crisis. So we're gonna have, uh, I think, quite a robust conversation um, again, if you have questions, feel free to uh, toss them in the section. We will have some time at the end for some Q&A. Um, and I will be sending out a follow-up email to everyone with um, data questions and uh, some of the highlights from today's conversation for you all to follow up. So without further ado, I'm going to send it over to David and uh, let him take the reins. Thank you very much. Uh the introduction. Uh, my name is David Lassiter. I spent uh, the past 25 years in higher education administration, primarily at Purdue University. Uh, for the last 90 days, I've been the CEO and president of the Community Foundation of Greater Lafayette. And it's an honor for me to be here today. And it's even a bigger honor for me to, to moderate this panel of distinguished guests. Uh, we have with us several individuals that, that bring a wealth of experience and knowledge uh, on the issues in which we're going to be discussing tonight. Um, the first I'd like to, to ask to introduce herself is Tamara Winfrey Harris. She's with the Central Indiana Community Foundation. Tamara? Hello, I am, as David said, Tamara Winfrey Harris. I'm the Vice President of Community Leadership and Effective Philanthropy at the Central Indiana Community Foundation. That means my department does our grant making as well as our donor services and, and scholarships research, a few other things. Um, and just to share a little bit of information on community foundations because they can be um, confusing and strange places. Um, every county in Indiana has a community foundation, thanks to Lily, but CICF, well, the Indianapolis Foundation is one of the country's uh, oldest foundations. We are over um, 100 years old. And like a lot of other community foundations, we do three things. So we um, give money to, we give grants to effective not-for-profit organizations. We help people invest in causes that matter most to them. And this third one, not all community foundations do, but a greater and greater number are doing that. And that is we provide community leadership to make the community a better place. And for CICF, that means a new mission that we've had for about a year. And that is we are mobilizing people, ideas and investment to make central Indiana a place where every individual has access uh, to the opportunity they need to reach their potential, no matter place, race, or identity. Fantastic. Thank you, Tamara. Uh, our next is Jamie Goodwin. Jamie? Hi, everyone. I'm so glad to be here. I'm Jamie Goodwin, and I'm a PhD candidate at the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy, hopefully finishing this summer and also a senior fellow at Sagamore Institute. And I'm very interested in uh, cross-cultural intelligence in philanthropy and also partnerships and uh, interpersonal relationships across cultural difference. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, our next panelist is Tracy Hall. Tracy. 
Tracy. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, happy to be here with you. I am the executive director of the American Library Association, and I've been in this position all of about uh, five weeks. And prior to that, I um, directed the uh, the uh, portfolio, the culture portfolio for uh, the Joyce Foundation, which is a 70 year old foundation here in uh, the Chicagoland area um, that focuses on um, the vitality of Great Lake City. So we work in uh, six states um, in the Midwest and Earlier in my career, I also worked in corporate social responsibility um, in global corporate citizenship or corporate philanthropy for the Boeing uh, uh, company where I was um, a strategist and then ultimately our um, Chicago community investor and happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So as you can tell, we have a, a broad uh, breadth and depth of experience to bring to the, the panel discussion tonight. And uh, I know we only have about an hour, so I'm gonna go ahead and jump straight into it. Uh, I'm gonna read a, read a statement first. And this statement uh, uh, comes by way of a, a research report that the WK Kellogg Foundation did. And according to this report uh, titled, Cultures of Giving, Energizing and Expanding Philanthropy by and for Communities of Color, it's a direct quote, Charitable giving in the U.S. quickly is becoming more ethnically, culturally, and socioeconomically diverse. Yet, conventional philanthropy has not fully recognized, embraced, and partnered with communities of color and needs to understand and support philanthropy if it is to drive social change. Um, what I would ask the panel to do is, is to react to that statement and to um, uh, share your thoughts. Tamara? So, so there, there are a few things tied up there. I mean, we know that we live in a country with a history of racism and race bias. Um, and so I think two things are at play. Um, one is that the sector very often ignores the unique ways that African Americans and other people of color give. You know, we often talk about time, talent, and treasure, um, but um, uh, as, as is often happens in a capitalist society, our focus is always on the treasure. So, you know, when we talk about philanthropists, we talk about, you know, Bill Gates, um, not about the African American family um, that is consistently giving um, uh, to their church to get a new roof. I mean, we actually know that studies show that African Americans give a higher portion of uh, their income and in giving, but are, are generally overlooked as philanthropists. So there's that. And there's also the idea very often that philanthropists know better than the communities they serve. Um, what, what do they need? Um, and so the tendency for foundations is to do things to communities and not with them. And that, that actually has been um, one of the, the central focuses of our, our, our efforts at CICF to work to move more equitably. We realize that, that for very many people, a foundation period is a very inequitable place. And so we're trying to figure out how to move differently so we don't recommit those sins. Could you give us an example? Give us an example of a, of a, of a foundation's actions where they would um, to the community rather than with the community. Could you give us a, an example that from your past? So, for example, you know, how, how often do, so one thing that we're doing new, so we just launched in response to this COVID crisis, um, a neighborhood relief fund. And one of the things we're doing differently with that fund is we have a series of neighborhood ambassadors, really they're just residents and people are very active in their communities. And they're working side by side along with our uh, community leadership officers in order to decide where that money goes. So we're not just, you know, foundations have relationships with not so, lots of not for profits. And the tendency is for us to make the decisions what not for profits are doing good work 
without talking to the people who are on the ground that they're supposed to be serving, without asking, are they really doing what you need? Are they open when you need them? Are they really serving you in an equitable way? So for this particular fund, we are working very, very closely with folks on the ground in the neighborhood. And that's something new for us um, that um, I hope will become more of our regular uh, grant making process. Perfect, perfect. So Jamie, I know a lot of your uh, research has been in the Latino population. Uh, could you respond to that uh, quote from that perspective? Sure, absolutely. I would, um, I would agree with that. And I would agree with what Tamara said, and I would just add, um, particularly in in um, marginalized or or communities where individuals might have some other material challenges. Um, I think many times um, they don't see their giving as um, I'm giving to this organization and I'm helping my family or I'm loaning money to my neighbor or I'm volunteering. They don't see those as separate. Um, Separate activities, their their philanthropic work is is unitary. I think it would be um, be described as, and it's difficult for people that are generous to even become conscious of how much they're giving. So um, when you think about the philanthropic activity of uh, the Latinx uh, community, many times that's uh, remittances. So almost a hundred billion dollars in remittances that are sent to countries of origin. Um, to their faith communities, to their neighborhoods. Again, it has a tendency to be more spontaneous and informal. Um, and unfortunately, in some, in some ways, that's not counted as real sometimes, um, but it is very real and, and maybe is, is the real fabric of, of philanthropy in our country. So let me ask a, a question. So when you say it's necessarily counted as real, so it's not come out on any basis and it says, you know, X number of billions of dollars were given this year. It's not all captured. Is that essentially what you're trying to say? It's not captured um, um, in our tax returns, obviously. It's not been the focus of scholarship uh, up till now. And really it's difficult for an organization, a, a, a foundation sometimes to be accountable, depending on their accountability and evaluation structures, um, how that money is dispersed and, and what, what's been done with it. Okay. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, Tracy, do you have anything to add as it relates to uh, your experiences? Well, I guess the only thing that I would add is that sometimes the places where uh, communities of color actually invest their stewardship uh, are not even uh, counted on our maps when we think about uh, philanthropy. So one of the, um, one of uh, the things that was really important, you know, when I was at the Joyce Foundation is to think about um, the gap or the gulf between what traditional philanthropy even identified as an art space or an arts organization and what the community identified as an arts organization. So uh, what we found is that, you know, especially neighborhood based um, arts offerings were off often uh, secondary or tertiary um, offerings for an organization that could be counted as a social service organization or could be counted as a religious organization or venue um, or institution. So I, you know, I just want to echo, I think what my co-panelists are saying is that, um, you know, oftentimes because philanthropy tradition has traditionally followed um, or used the same lens um, as say, you know, our standard American corporations, we miss so much when we think about, you know, what stewardship looks like, what uh, philanthropic giving and contribution look like. And uh, I just want to add that it's also a mapping situation. It's also um, about the gaze and it's also about validating uh, institutions that might be created by um, and led by communities and that may not necessarily follow the norm, so to speak, of, um, of organizations, uh, you know, of other organizations. Wow, perfect, perfect. Uh, before I jump to the next question, I do want to give uh, a little bit of a shout out to uh, this book, and, and I think that we're going to put it up later on uh, for everyone. Uh, it's a book I read in preparation for this. I 
uh, and uh, it's just absolutely found fantastic. Dr. Wagner, I think she's a faculty member at the IU Center on Philanthropy, but the book's titled Diversity and Philanthropy, Expanding the Circle of Giving. So it's, a, it's an excellent resource uh, for those of you that want to, to learn more. Um, so, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, uh, we, we, we touched upon it to a, to a degree uh, when responding to the last question uh, in terms of, of um, the variations of, of, uh, of, uh, and definitions of philanthropy among communities of color. Um, specifically, that I think that they, there, there are some different uh, nuances there among the communities of color in terms of how they define philanthropy. And we talked about it in terms of how they give but could you talk a little bit more, uh, panelists, on on what the perception is of philanthropy within those communities? You can jump in. Sure. sure. I mean, I would say that, you know, I think there is, um, you know, there are, you know, varying uh, definitions depending on where you are. I think there are different um, relationships depending on where you are, what time you're in. I think that, you know, sometimes there is a really syncretic um, and synchronistic um, relationship between, you know, large P or formal uh, philanthropy and communities. But oftentimes there's also distrust, um, you know, and a sense of parental um, or of I know better than you know, or that the wisdom is always outside of the group. And I think that um, what I've been really happy to see is that there has been um, on the rise, I think a new um, a new crop of um, people who are philanthropists and who are working in philanthropy, either in traditional spaces or you know who are taking entrepreneurial approaches um, to philanthropy, where you're seeing more you know more and more of the people who come from quote unquote target communities actually leading. Uh, philanth uh, uh, philanthropic organizations and um, and setting a table amongst their peers and really seeing the community as their co-creators. And so, you know, one thing I can say when, you know, I was at Joyce um, is that one of the last um, projects that um, I created, an initiative that I created was with um, people in across Chicago, all sides of Chicago, who were involved in um, creating generational wealth. Um, especially for Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. And so um, that spanned our Vietnamese community um, and Argyle Street. It spanned our um, Latinx community um, in Little Village and Pilsen and also Logan Square. Our African-American and African um, communities on the South Side, the West Side, and parts of the North Side. Um, you know, and um, our um, Indigenous um, communities, which, you know, Chicago is home to Illinois, but Chicago in particular is home to, I think, the third or fourth largest um, Indigenous um, community, especially, and, and one of the largest um, outside of Minneapolis, St. Paul, um, of city-based um, um, Indigenous um, uh, residents. And so one of the things that happened is in that creation of the Equitable Investment in the Arts um, Initiative, was to say to these um, communities and to these entrepreneurial philanthrop philanthropic leaders, how can we help you uh, with monies that you actually will designate and that the community uh, will actually designate, um, will go to building of institutions or the expansion of institutions that are meaningful to you? How do we take the funds that we have in this um, in, in the foundation and how do we disseminate them to you for your use and your oversight? And lastly, how do you create evaluation tools that will determine that when we uh, decide whether or not this three-year effort was successful, that it is successful based on your terms and not ours? So I do think that is because there is a rising group. I hope I'm one of them. Um, but I do think that, you know, well beyond that, there is a rising group of um, people in philanthropy who are leading uh, philanthropic organizations or creating their own that are saying that we want to use a framework that is based in social justice and that sees the community as co-creators um, in projects and initiatives as opposed to be acted upon as we've talked about. So let, let me, I, oh. uh, I, there, there are two different things that, that you said that I, I think that I wanna touch upon, but first I wanna see if any of the other panelists um, because you brought up the, the notion of trust, 
Uh, and I think that's a critical notion. Uh, but Tamara, go ahead. So, you know, two things, you know, you, you talked about philanthropy and the way we view it. And I think very often what, in particularly the African-American community, you know, we don't, don't always think of what we do as philanthropy. It has been a part of our survival. And I would say the same for Latinx and, you know, native communities. It is just helping the community. It's making sure that the grandmother down the street has her medicine. It's making sure that the church is taken care of. It's making sure that people in the community have what they need. And then there are other venues of philanthropy. While we know that African-Americans give in higher proportions to the church, you know, I grew up with both of my parents being very active in historically black sororities and fraternities and continuing to give even today in their 70s and 80s giving money, participating in projects that give back to the community that way. And I think that's something unique about our community. And the other thing I was going to mention is that last year at CICF was launched the African American Legacy Fund of Indianapolis. And that was an effort by 100 um, African Americans in Indianapolis to create an endowed fund that would take care of the black community in central Indiana, hopefully in perpetuity. Um, because, you know, Tracy mentioned the idea of paternalism. We tend to think of wealthy white philanthropists going into black and brown communities um, and giving to them. And this is a case, as there are several cases around the, the, the country. Um, Columbus, I believe, has its own African American fund. Many other community foundations do, but there is now one in central Indiana as well. Chicago has a, a very yeah. old one as well. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, the notion of, of uh, I'm sorry, Jamie, do you have anything to add in that, in that realm? Sure, David, you had asked me this question earlier and I looked back I was on a research project that took me to um, Medellin, Colombia this past summer, and there were scholars there from, from throughout Latin America, and we asked them this question, what do you think about this word philanthropy? And it was not a very popular word there, and it, it had the same sort of ties that, that we've been talking about. Um, there were a few young scholars actually that we're kind of bringing it back. There's a bit of resurgence, it's sort of new identity around it. So I don't think that the term is lost, but needs some new energy. But the, what they used was the idea of solidarity, um, this unity or agreement of feeling or action. So the idea of um, the money that I give is not separate from who I am, but but I'm bringing my whole self and um, and uniting with, with these things that I believe in. And then the idea of social investment um, was very important to them. And um, my favorite word that what I'm exploring the most right now is um, the idea of mutuality. So individuals relating each other based on interest in them as whole people, not only their needs, but also the assets that they bring and also who they are, you know, just living life alongside them, kind of um, taking away the distance, uh, not just financially, but but relationally as well. Okay. And can I say one thing? I just will make this very quick, but you know, and I, I'm really happy that we are moving beyond the notion of treasure because, you know, we look at COVID-19, uh, you know, one of the things that I'm watching, I live in the far south side in the Pullman neighborhood um, in uh, Chicago. And one of the things that I see where I see um, real largesse and social investment and stewardship and philanthropy um, is in the ways in which food, in particular food, because, you know, Chicago is home to one of the largest contiguous sets of what we would call food deserts um, in the country. And one of the things in terms of just the difference between just money, uh, you know, just currency, the, the biggest area of exchange uh, really is food. And you really see what's needed at this time. And, uh, you know, and it's just been interesting to see the ways in which food and people who cook and people who use food as their ministry, the way that they're finding ingenious ways to disseminate um, uh, food throughout the city and to create new access points um, for food. And so I just want to bring that in and call that out that, you know, we're still dealing with issues like real hunger. 
uh, and um, and people who live in spaces where food access, um, you know, is uh, is 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 very uh, fragile. And so we're seeing now how people are defying notions of traditional philanthropy and creating new pathways for um, uh, new pathways for access, you know, through food alone. And I hope that people. I'm trying to document that myself, but I hope that people are watching that. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 fantastic. Uh, in terms of the the Chicago land coming together to to address that uh, issue, I, you know, I'm not I'm not I'm uh, not. Uh, well, let me let me let me change, go back to something that that um, Tamara had had talked about. Uh, she mentioned trust. Uh, trust is an important thing in in um, philanthropy, especially among uh, communities of communities of color. And I, I hope, in addition to students and potentially faculty members and and maybe community members we have on this, I hope we have some some, some people who are in the fundraising field, people who, who will be going out and and, and talking with uh, folks about giving money. So speaking to those, the individuals who are are out there that that potentially have you know are going to go and raise money, uh, talk about trust. Talk about trust in philanthropy and and how do how do you how does that occur within communities of color? I mean, I think one of the things I would say is, you know, we're, we're largely talking about white institutions who may be going into communities of color um, and fundraising. I mean, communities of color have every reason not to trust white institutions because of a very long history in this country. However, I think, you know, most funders know what it is they need to do. I mean, fundraising is is predicated on relationship building, except very often, um, you know, we do, fundraisers don't know how to build authentic relationships with communities of color, um, and very often foundations and you know we know you you join the country club, you go to the chamber meetings, you go to like there's this formula of building relationships with wealthy people. <laughs> that doesn't include, that it is very focused on whiteness and doesn't include building relationships with black and brown communities. And it's, it's the relationships that are going to have to lead um, if, if we're going to uh, increase philanthropy, um, traditional philanthropy among communities of color. And that also means having more people of color on your staff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think that that um, the, the notion spanning beyond treasure, as we've been talking about so uh, eloquently earlier, is is critically important too in terms of of where we're going as a as a society. Um, Jamie, do you have anything to add on on that? I would just say um, this idea of co-production. There's a lot of writing. I'm thinking of Lane Benjamin does a lot of writing about co-production and she um, what I trust. I want to span boundaries. I know that there's people in my community that have a very different lived experience than than what I have. And she describes it as um, and, and shared co-produced philanthropic work as um, many times we approach it. Uh, relationships in order to accomplish tasks, but a uh, possibly better way to think about it for the long term health of the communities that are being served are um, tasks that are designed really to grow relationships. So when you think about the core work of, of um, a foundation or, or a, a nonprofit, so much of what we do is task oriented. And that's good, you know, we're, we're trying to do something. Um, we're trying to solve a problem. We're trying to imagine a new future. At the same time, how can we move to the very center of our work and and build strategy around um, tasks that are really in the long game about building these trust relationships? Excellent, excellent. Um, Tracy, do you have anything to to add on that? I would just, I would just add the idea of proximity, which is something that. Um, you know, that Brian Stevenson talks a lot about, um, you know, I've split my career a lot between homeless services, 
early in my career, libraries and philanthropy. And I would have to say that my um, approach to philanthropy, you know, has been influenced a lot by my approach to librarianship or what I learned there and also homeless services. And it really is about proximity. It's hard and um, it feels like judgment to make decisions about philanthropy when you don't know the interior of people's lives and the context in which um, they are trying to either um, uh, aggregate assets, solve problems, or you know just be responsive or preemptive. And so one of the things that I know a lot of times is that you know as um, you know working as a program director is that often I would not just go to um, go to meet with uh, you know a grantee. Uh, just as, as a site visit, I was invested in the work. I wanted to learn from the work. A lot of times I was learning yeah. and I would tell people all the time, you know, what I'm trying to do here is is to learn more and to learn from you and maybe to scale some of your uh, solutions so that we can all learn as a city together. So I would say proximity. And and one thing that we used to say a lot when, you know, when I was like a library, after I was a branch librarian and more a library administrator, I would say to branch librarians, please don't manage a branch where you are not comfortable and you're not willing to walk in the community because the expectation is that your community oftentimes is walking into the library. If you cannot walk those same streets, if you don't feel comfortable, imagine how they feel. It should determine in terms of, you know, programming times, et cetera. I could say a lot more, you know, obviously because I'm here at ALA and we're 150 years old. And I like to think that libraries have been on the vanguard, you know, on the front lines of every social movement that we've had in every crisis. So a lot of my approach to phila philanthropy is about um, popular informatics. How do we make sure that people get the information and the resources that they need to make the best life choices? It's the same in philanthropy. How do we get people the resources that they need um, to do the same? And it is about proximity. You cannot be an effective philanthropist just from your armchair or just you know in the office. You just can't do it. That's a, that's an excellent uh, transition to another question that I've been been thinking about, and that is, uh, you know, you, you're a, a previous. Uh, in a, in a funding position with the Joyce Foundation and certainly Tamara uh, in her position within the Community Foundation in Central Indiana. Um, so, so how do um, you give to communities of color? What are the considerations that you need to have uh, as, a, as a funder? Uh, and and you, you started to allude, them, allude to, to some of them. So Tamara, I'm gonna turn that back to you and see if you have any comments as it relates to that question. So part of that for us, because now our focus is on equity, um, we have really zeroed in on race um, because we have been following um, all of the data that I'm sure everyone else has um, about um, what's happening with economic mobility in our country. And we know several things to be true that um, it's a lot less likely that you will do better than your parents that it's harder than ever to pull your way out of poverty. In fact, Indianapolis is number 46 out of the top 50 cities in the United States in terms of economic mobility, which means if you are born poor here, you are likely to remain poor here. And we know that race has a profound impact on whether or not you will have economic mobility. And so as we've zeroed in on equity, we realize that one of the places that we have to start is with race and we need to start focusing our resources there. Um, and so, you know, I wish I had a perfect answer to this question, but the reality is we are a more than hundred year old organization that's trying to figure out how, what historically white led and, and white run organization is trying to figure out how to do things differently. Um, so one of the things we're looking at doing is um, releasing an equity framework um, so that everyone knows the lens through which we make grants, including looking at whether or not recipients are, have uh, staff and leadership and board that are reflective of the people that they say that they serve. Um, whether or not those not-for-profits have um, a feedback loop with the community like how do you listen to the people that you say you serve 
do you listen to those people and how do you act on that? Um, uh, there, we're also looking at building better relationships with grassroots and person of color led organizations, which are historically not funded as much as much as white led organizations, which also means taking a look at some of uh, the standards and what foundations request in terms of applications and tracking and reporting. We certainly want to know that our dollars are being used successfully, um, but we don't want that to be a barrier to the right people getting the right money, uh, getting, getting what they need to serve the community. And then another part of that is that I mentioned, we have an ambassador program that started as an ambassador in each of about 36 neighborhoods across Indianapolis and some in Hamilton County that helped that that went out in neighborhoods and talked to uh, their fellow residents about what you know what they love about their neighborhoods, what their neighborhood needs, where the opportunities are, where the challenges are, and then we have kept on several of um, those ambassadors, and they are working alongside us to do work in neighborhoods. So um, they are, you know, helping to represent us on, you know, certain committees. Um, they are helping to inform um, how we know better what not-for-profits, you know, are doing in those neighborhoods. So working alongside with the community to, to distribute money um, and, and other resources. Fantastic, thank you, thank you. Uh, Tracy or, or Jamie, do you have anything to add? One, one thing that I'll say, and I'm interested to hear what Jamie has to say. One thing that I'll say is that, you know, when we talk about this, you know, cause I'm never, I've never been somebody who um, just, you know, will talk about race just for race sake. Um, and I think it's so important that we have this focus, you know, when we talk about equity, diversity, inclusion um, in the field, because I want to talk about how it shows up, right? So, how it shows up and why we do need to have an intensive focus on race when we talk about equity in American philosophy today is because it shows up in things like the invisibility of labor, right? So it shows up in terms of um, the ways in which you see economies, you know, working in grants. So um, I'm always interested in um, what happens, you know, when I was at, you know, Joyce, one of the things that we did, over, you know, year over year was to take our uh, philanthropic giving and to turn it on its head. It used to be that it was really hard for an organization that, say, um, had an operating um, budget of under, say, three hundred, two hundred, or three hundred thousand dollars to get a grant, because the idea was, well. You know, if you give somebody who has a, you know, $200,000 operating budget, a $75,000, it's going to upturn the organization or, you know, what are, I've even had some, you know, someone asked me before, well, what would they do with that kind of money? And you would see that what the return on investment or what the return on impact would be um, when you gave um, monies to, you know, some of those smaller neighborhood based organizations, but oftentimes their labor was invisible. All of the work, all of the output, all of the outcomes associated with that grant, they just didn't register. And then I also want to talk about language. Um, I mean, they registered in the community. You could find the impact in the community. You could even find models. But it just, just to, you know, sort of like uh, philanthropy that's like, you know, in, from the airplane view. But also, I want to think about the language. Um, too, of um, sometimes um, people associating larger organizations or white-led organizations as being more strategic or being smart. There's, um, a, you know, there's a way in which, and I'll just be very, very honest, that we are, our racism by, from, you know, from seeing innovation and um, the intellectual capacity that happens in organizations led by people of color and smaller organizations, and you see that bias. Sometimes, again, when I would, uh, you know, ask and, you know, I can be really funny, I would sort of like want to ask my colleagues, okay, you know, so our grants, uh, because our portfolio was the smallest arts, you know, it's a lot of times in, um, in, in many uh, philanthropic organizations, it'll be the smallest portfolio, unless it's mostly an arts and culture based portfolio. So I would tease my colleagues who are all wonderful and super great. I would say, so what did you get for that investment, that $300,000 investment? And I would compare that to what I got for, you know, an investment. 
And I have to say, by the end of my tenure there, people were beginning to say, we're looking at how you're investing because the return on investment um, was just so amazing. Are there more resources that should be distributed across the board in a lot of the areas that we fund in philanthropy? Absolutely. So I'm not taking anything away and any shine from anybody's show. But what I am saying is that the language of philanthropy still invisibilizes the labor of people of color. It um, also um, uh, uh, connects a certain amount of intellectual acumen um, and also strategic, strategic operations to certain organizations and not to others. And if you want to, you know, really get what I'm saying, you know, compare the language used, um, you know, around Serena Williams and how she plays tennis, uh, uh, you know, uh, compared to John McEnroe, you will see that same McEnroe Williams divide in philanthropy. Can I, and Jamie? Can I, I see. Add, you. Can Jamie? I? Oh, yeah. I, Go I was going to just Go piggyback on something that Tracy just said. And I, you know, I think it's important for me to add that our, our our neighborhood community ambassadors are compensated for their time for that very reason. Because when the community a community member should not be working for an eight hundred and twenty million dollar community foundation for free, their knowledge of the community, their social capital in the community, all of those things have value, and we recognize that. Excellent. So, Jamie, I saw you nodding your head several times during both uh, what Tamara just said and also along with Tracy. So, uh, do you have something to add? Yeah, these are great ideas. I'm just so glad to be a part of this as a listener first, but um, I would add the concept of um, philanthropy being accountable, not just to solve a certain problem or solve today's problems, but also grow a community's capacity to solve problems. So, when we think about diversity um, to include young people, um, to include all, all types of difference and to um, take a risk in um, giving them a, a role that, that is a role of leadership, you know, where, where um, possibly they might fail, um, but, but creating a system where we are growing um, opportunities for people uh, across many levels of difference um, to learn to solve problems and to learn to imagine for the future of their own communities. And I would suggest one resource that I can um, send along later, which is um, Alnora Ibrahim, Measuring Social Change, and um, talks just a lot about the ideas that that we just mentioned and many more. I think would be very helpful. Perfect. Um, thank you. Thank you. This is outstanding. Uh, you know, one one thing that uh, Tracy did bring up, or, or it may have been uh, uh, Jamie. No, I think it was Tracy. Um, we're, we're in a we're in a COVID world, so to speak, right now. You know, we're we're, we're um, that's consuming all that we're we're doing. Um, so as we as we think about a post COVID nineteen world and, and philanthropy, what are the learnings? What what because we we've talked a lot about uh, different issues as it relates to philanthropy and and how uh, it can be um, it should be viewed differently. Uh, and, and, and consider it in a different way. As we're looking at a post-COVID-19 world, what are what are the learnings that we can take away to, to make the philanthropic sector better? I mean, that's what that's what we all want to do. Is we want we want to make it better. We want to help more people. That's why I took this job. I want to I want to make well, I want to make the world better. So, uh, what what do we do in a in a post-COVID-19 world um, with our philanthropic efforts? To, to make um, the world a better place for, for particularly for communities of color in the in philanthropy. I mean, I think this highlights the importance of viewing philanthropy through the lens of equity. Um, it should not be that you know when schools have to close because of a pandemic some kids get to continue to have a good education and some kids don't it should not be that some workers have to make a decision between their health or showing up to work um it should all you know it, it should not be that it takes a pandemic for people to have flexible schedules and to be able to stay home with their families when they need to so hopefully this will help us identify the ways where we haven't been working smartly and we haven't been working 
equitably. Um, and, you know, to help us zero in on the areas that really the priority areas that need uh, philanthropic support and also push us towards innovation that allows for more equity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Tracy, do you have anything to add on that on that uh, in terms of what a post COVID-19 what learnings we could take away? Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, Tamara said so many. I would, you know, definitely say collaboration. I think um, that the thing that stands out to me is the symbiotic relationship that we have with each other, how interdependent we are, um, and how it requires um, a sharing of uh, information, uh, deep access to information, network building, and all of that is about interdependence. So I think collaboration and interdependence, thought sharing, um, all of those things are things that, you know, for me, what I've seen in the organization I now work in is that, um, you know, it's 150 years old and it's 57,000 members. And, um, you know, one of our really old associations because librarianship as a profession is quite old. Um, you know, I literally work with some of the smartest people in the country, literally, you know, and one of the things is that they're saying is that we've never worked together so deeply, either in the association or with our member leaders. You know, some of the things that have happened, you know, that we're thinking about because we have a philanthropic um, advisory group or philanthropy advisory group here. One of the biggest issues, you know, that we're looking at is our vulnerable populations who does not have access to life saving resources around COVID-19 and one of our most vulnerable populations and where we're having to pull all the stops when it comes to philanthropy and make these appeals, um, you know, is when it comes to people who are incarcerated or detained. Because, um, you know, many times they're charged by the minute to read because a lot of the resources that they have access to are electronic and they are being charged to read and to read what's happening and quote unquote the outside. And also um, many times that we may not understand this because we're so beleaguered with information related to COVID-19 contagion rates and responses. They are not privy to that. So when it comes to collaboration, we're also finding that we have to collaborate, those of us who enjoy the freedom of either, uh, you know, being able, as you know, Tamara said, the privilege of being able to work from home because we have the internet and, um, you know, and people who don't have it at all, who don't have access to it are, you know, who are being charged a lion's share of any uh, monies that they may have access to, to read per minute. So it is that idea to collaborate, uh, of collaborating across geographies, across difference, across networks, et cetera, that I want to continue to see, um, you know, in a post-COVID world. And, and we have to retain that, if nothing else. Excellent, excellent. Jamie, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I would just say two quick things about that, that um, I've seen through COVID that um, we really need to, to develop in the philanthropic sector, uh, both and approaches to our work in the sense of um, constantly pushing and delegating responsibilities to the grassroots, to the family and neighborhood levels uh, in order to to solve these problems and, and flourish and overcome things together. But then also to recognize that some of these challenges do take global coordination across sectors to address effectively. So not everything can be done at the grassroots level. We do need these these incredibly complex, sophisticated organizations that span countries and, um, you know, work out differences at a level that that we're not even privy to. And, and we've all seen so many examples of when that's gone well in this crisis and when that's gone poorly and the effect that it has on people. David, we're getting some questions that's, in the that's chat. That's certainly true. Of, that's certainly true. David, we're getting some questions in the chat that I think are really important. One is, how do you secure the board's buy-in as we move towards more equitable investment? And the reason why I'm bringing that one up is because, you know, a lot of what we're talking about, the change management that we're suggesting for the field in traditional philanthropy, formal philanthropy, it must have board buy-in. So I don't know if that's something that you want to take on or speak to from your own experience, David. And I would love to hear from um, either uh, Tamara or, uh, you know, or Jamie about this as well. So I, uh, for some reason, I can't see the chat. Uh, so 
I don't know. But so, so yeah, if you want, if you want to ask the, the questions coming through the chat, that would be, that would be perfect about uh, exactly where we should be in terms of timing to open it up for, for those types of questions. So I, again, I, for some reason, I can't see the questions. Um, okay. Well, I, well, I will ask this one and I'm going to now, I'm going to turn the tables on you three on David, but you know, um, and so here's one I think is really important. Can you all speak to strategies for securing the board's buy-in as you move towards more equitable investment? I'll ask you first, David. So, uh, given my, given I've been in my role now for all of 90 days, um, in all honesty, I, I haven't given a whole lot of thought uh, to that. What I have given thought to, though, is when I came on to the to the to my role. Uh, I looked around at the at the board members and they weren't very diverse, um, you know, and, and so what I'm doing in the um, uh, what I'm doing right now and I'm going to present to the board in, in July is I'm doing an assessment of our board. You know, what 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 uh, is the backgrounds? What are the um, what are the you know, what do they look like from a cultural perspective and, and then versus what our community looks like? And, and so how should that and, and that's that's how I'm at least approaching it at this per, at this point, because we first need to look like what the community is so we can can have some semblance of knowledge about what their importancy important factors are as we go out and make our grant making. But as I've just listened to both you and, and Tracy or Tracy and, and Tamara talk today, I've got a lot of learning to do myself uh, on, on how to. to to approach these issues as it relates to to our grant making, um, we're not even close to where we need to be. Okay, that's really important. I want to ask you, Tamara, and then Jamie the same question. And I wonder, Tamara, if you can speak a little bit to class differences too, because I think that sometimes you know we assume that because you know that all people of color, say for instance, are monolithic. There are some real class issues across the board as well. Education differences, et cetera. So I just want to nuance it a little bit too, Tama. So one of the things that was important for our board and our staff as well is the while we were, so a lot of this came out of our strategic, our strategic planning. Um, and before we could put together a plan, we began our learning journey, a learning journey that continues. And one of the first things that we all did was the entire staff Man, it was mandatory for us to go through the two day intensive um, equity training program on doing racism. Um, our entire staff had to go through all new staff goes through and the majority of our board made it through. Um, and we continue to have education education opportunities that we try to where we try to bring everyone in because that's important. It's important one for the reasons you said that just because I'm an African American woman does not mean I understand all the nuances of why marginalized neighborhoods are marginalized or I have a lot to undo as well. Um, it doesn't that just because you're Latinx doesn't mean you know the history of Latinx oppression in the United States. So all of us needed to know how those systems work and it was important for our board to know so that they could understand and endorse what we were doing. And I think that education was a big part of why our board gave us a tremendous amount of grace. So, you know, strategic planning processes are supposed to take a year. Ours took a little over two years and they were fine with that. They allowed us to do that because they realized we were trying to make a significant change. And, you know, you know, since then I've spoken to a lot of other funders and and community foundations and they've always asked like how do you do equity on a on a large scale if your leadership is not on board and the reality is you don't i mean you can't we can we always know how to work over like we learn how to work around things from our seats but if you want to change the system you have to bring your board and leadership along the hour mark. Um, you have done a phenomenal job. Thank you so very much. Uh, everyone's asking, is this being recorded? Is this being recorded? Um, 
I, I want to ask one final question and then allow you all to have some closing thoughts if you do. Uh, this one is slash direct university foundation offices that say they cannot find and hire employees with experience to lead university philanthropy within communities of color. James, do you want to put a last word on that? I'm sorry. I think I'm experiencing um, some uh, issues. My response. Oh. Hi, Tamara. My response to that is yes, you can. <laughs> I mean, it, it, you know, a lot of sectors claim that they can't find diverse, you know, diverse candidates, and I push back. I would push back on that and say. You're not going to find diverse candidates if you continue to do what you've been doing. If you continue to hire from the pools that you know and from the people that you know. So it goes back again, to just what we said about identifying fund holders relationships. If you have no relationships in diverse communities, then you're not going to find any candidates. So you need to develop those relationships and change the way you look for people cast a wide net so that you have a diversity of candidates and then choose. You have to make it a priority. What was, it, was, it, what was the question again? Because I was breaking, you're still breaking up. Or direct university foundation offices that say they cannot find and hire employees with the experience to lead university philanthropy with communities of color. So, so, you know, um, I, my, my previous was at, at Purdue and in one of my roles, I was uh, responsible for hiring and um, you know, in some cases, hiring a lot, a lot of folks. And one of the things that we ended up having to develop and, and unfortunately it's no longer, it's no longer uh, continuing. But one of the things that we developed was a um, internship program uh, in order to try to bring in of color to, 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 to work in the, the uh, uh, development field. Um, one of the larger issues, and this relates to that, that central question, uh, I can't recall who I was telling this to today, but I was, I was talking today. I, I go and, and do a talk to uh, a sales and marketing class at Purdue, um, at least I used to, uh, when I was associated with the university. And uh, I would always start the conversation and ask who's interested in a career in philanthropy and you know raise your hand and, and across the board and then i i would go and, and talk with everyone about uh what it looks like what it feels like what what the how how powerful you can be um in a career of philanthropy and and what what you can accomplish um in a career in philanthropy with the intention being hopefully encouraging some folks to, to, to go into it, but there's no question we need to do better. Um, there's no question. CASE has a Council for the Advancement and Support of Education. Uh, the program that, that I uh, did when I was associated with Purdue was um, through the Council on Support of Education. It was a, it was a na nationwide program where you would uh, jump on board and, and, and they would help shops um, that, that didn't have great, you know, uh, didn't have um, not the ability, but but needed help in, in, in recruiting. Um, so that's one way. That's how I would respond. Okay. Tracy and Jamie. Yeah. Um, Jamie, do you wanna do you wanna go or? Go ahead, Tracy. Okay. I guess what I would say is, that, and I started to type it, is I would say that. One of the things that's really important to me, especially, you know, in uh, philanthropy, knowing that there are some of the issues that, you know, we're talking about um, resident is that I always did a couple of things and Jamie talked about, um, you know, younger people too. So I always did a couple of things um, and some of my colleagues started doing it too. So I made sure that, you know, in my case in the arts, we have two big meetings that we would go to a year. One is Americans for the Arts, where I was on an advisory committee and the other one is grant makers in the arts. Anytime that I was going to any of those meetings, I had written in my budget and it meant that I had to use some of my budget to do this, that 
that I would always have um, somebody reflective of the communities with which we were engaged, usually from one of those organizations, that I would pay to take them there. So it meant that yeah. sometimes I would ask them, you know, if we got a um, Airbnb, because I had a, a finite travel budget, um, if we got an Airbnb and you were able to have your own restroom on this side and I was able to have my own, would you be comfortable? And if they said yes, that it meant that I would often use the same price, the $262 or $195 a night that I would be using to pay for just a hotel room for an Airbnb in community. And I would also pay their registration. And then we usually have a, at least one meal together. And I would also invite someone else that's very respected in the field that is a peer to meet with them as well and have that dinner because that was my endorsement. Because what I always say is that everything that I do should session planning. And I'm going to drop it. I'm going to make it really real. In many times growing up, um, a lot of times in my career, I would live in communities that were mostly all white. And a lot of times I faced it a lot. Of, a, I faced a lot of housing discrimination. I lived in Seattle, for instance, in the late 1990s, um, mid 1990s to the early 2000s. And I moved um, twice while I was there. I was the first black person that anybody had rented to. And I can't tell you the um, gymnastics that I had to go through just to be able to get into these apartments. And so I've learned from that, that um, it is really important for me to use my positionality to endorse other leaders. Um, and so I've, you know, and my colleagues began to take notice. So taking leaders of color um, to conferences that it would be hard for them to afford and introducing them to the people who are considered to be the um, subject matter experts is just one way. Another time that I, another way that I would do that is when we would have foundation where we were supposed to be, bring experts, I would bring community-based experts so that people got a chance to see those people and put them in the, and see them in the position as me saying, this is an expert around these issues. And so I do think there are very organic ways to do it. And I'm really, one of the things I'm really happy is that when I left um, Joyce, some of those very same people that I had sort of supported who were, you know, younger and all those other things were people who were being uh, interviewed for my position because I was able to do organic succession planning. So it isn't hard to do, you just have to be willing to do it. Jamie? Yeah, I would just say on the flip side of that, I, early on in my career, um, I don't I don't know why, but um, just was blessed to have mentors who were people of color. And that really set me on a different trajectory. So to the degree that um, we can create systems in our fundraising departments where even before we get to a hiring decision or things like that, we're, we are so embedded in, in communities across many different types of differences that we already have those relationships in place. And, and it is such a priority to us that we are constantly seeking out ways that we can make our budget stretch, we can make our time stretch, you know, we can think about these things differently um, before we're at a at a decision point, I think that's when there will be more of an abundance of of opportunities. People of of all different types of diversity. Uh, David, can I say one thing to build on what Jamie said? It's something I, sh I forgot. One thing. Absolutely. In of, one thing in terms of you know on the flip side of that, that's important because you know because I also try to make sure that um, I also reach out to all people of color. When I first came to Chicago, one of the things I saw is that, you know, it was always a very black and white conversation. It was about the black community and the white community. And yet we had a very large Latino and we had a very large Asian and a very, and a uh, comparatively large indigenous population. So what I've learned from leaders of color and particularly some of the great leaders that I, um, you know, I think of is that how do we align our struggles to make sure that I'm able to bring people along who sometimes might be forgotten. And I also want to shout out that one another thing that I was able to do with the Joyce Foundation's permission, of course, was to do something with um, uh, uh, Americans for the Arts called the Art Leaders of Color Network. Um, and that was important. And, it, it, and we have people right in Indianapolis who were part of the first cohort of 12. We have four leaders, emerging leaders and, and um, early career, mid-career leaders from Indianapolis. And some of them are on this call, so I wanted to make sure that um, that I, I shouted them out. I'm not going to call them all by name, but I, I want to, you know, say that, um, 
you know, part of, of doing that is to codify it. So it isn't just about just individual relationship building. It's about attaching the name of, of the, uh, of, in our case, the Joyce Foundation to something in perpetuity so that um, our board um, has to say, you know, if, if diversity, equity, inclusion are priorities, this is what we're doing. This is the investment that we're making in that area. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you Thank so you. much. Uh, I appreciate that little tip <laughs> to the um, Americans for the Arts uh, Fellowship. It has been a pleasure to be a part of that fellowship. Um, it's been a pleasure to learn from you all in this conversation. Uh, Tamara, Jamie, Tracy, David, I appreciate every single one of you for providing um, the expertise, but also the transparency that has just been phenomenal. So I, I can't thank you enough for that. Uh, we are going to go ahead and close. Uh, we're we're reaching our time, and I would hate for us to just get cut off without a proper goodbye. Um, if anyone has a, 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 a maybe a, a one to three word closing statement um, or something you'd like to leave our participants with, whether it's a resource, a podcast, an article, um, or just a word of encouragement. I'll let you all have that last word and then we will close there. Tracy, Jamie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, thank you everyone for participating. And if I might recommend uh, a really great book uh, Decolonizing Wealth by Edgar Villanueva, um, which takes a very important look at a lot of the things that we've been talking about. He is, he is amazing. The Lilly School brought him here, well, along with CICF, to Indianapolis recently. If you have a chance to see him, please do. But the book is Decolonizing Wealth. What's the name of the author again? Edgar Villanueva. Great. Do you have any final closing thoughts? I would recommend the book, The Fearless Organization by Amy Edmondson. It talks about innovation um, more greatly, but um, specifically the idea of psychological safety on teams across difference. It's been a great help to me. It's based on a Google study. And um, just to close, my neighbor and I have started um, chit chatting at night and she always ends the conversation with, we'll keep watching out for each other. So. That's my hope for philanthropy in these times. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, I, I'm not sure I can do any better. So let's end with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. cool. Well, thank you everyone. Uh, thank please you. have a good evening and we will keep watching out for each other.